Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, I've been thinking a lot about learning, about gaining knowledge, about improving my skills. And I'm sure a lot of you have been too, you know, given the situation with COVID and a lot of us working remotely, the situation with uh, learning and development has seriously accelerated. And my guest today is maybe in the center of all that and maybe one of the best people that we could have to talk about it. Johnny Townsend, the president and co-founder of Circus Street, a learning solutions company, maybe one of the best people to address this issue. Now, I hope you're ready to see learning in a new light as we get right into it. I am here with Johnny Townsend, president and co-founder of Circus Street. Johnny, live from Boulder, Colorado. How are you doing? Hello, mate. How are you? It's snowy. Good. It's really snowy. It is. And, you know, and it's, it's only still uh, mid-autumn um, here as we're recording this. And here in New Jersey, the leaves are beautiful. They're changing colors. It's a little rainy. Um, I think snow is still far off, but Johnny just made a move from the East Coast to uh, Boulder, to the snowy, um, the snowy Rockies, and I think he got hit like as soon as the as soon as the move was complete. We got hit hard. It was almost like an insult. Uh, <laughs> like they, like know, they didn't want you there. <laughs> this kind of slap in the face. What you're doing here from New York? And London, and you know, who do you think you are? Get out! Well, well, clearly, clearly, you're not from around these parts. No, exactly, Mr. Right. Townsend. Exactly right. But no, we, we came over. We actually um, we, we we had some we, we had movers, right? But we mm -hmm. had house plants, and my yeah. wife didn't want to put the house plants with the movers, so we drove across the country. Wow! With the house plants in the car. So I, you know, we were driving past cops, and I'm thinking to myself, I hope they realise that these are house plants. You know. Well, you're um, going to Colorado, so that's not right. as much of an issue. Right, it isn't an issue at all. Um, but we drove across, and the countries you, you really get a sense of the country and the vastness of the country, and yeah, you know, and 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 the kind of amazing thing that 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 this place was turned into one country. It's just like it's just incredible. You know, eighteen hundred miles we drove, and we're not even we're only just halfway across it. Yeah, and it sheds it sheds a lot of light into why there are so many different opinions and, yes. and uh, different lifestyles in this country. Yeah, we saw a for lot sure. of different opinions on the way across. <laughs> well, I mean, you, did, you, did you cut straight across through New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio that way, or did Perfect. you go around? You, you nailed it, you, you went on the journey with us. Right I there. remember my elementary school geography yeah. really well. Yeah, um, we went I, through Nebraska and we went whoa. through, yeah. That's and flat. Then, and then we ended up on, on these plains. It's an incredible, you know, it's inc it's, I, I would recommend anyone do it because you, you recognize that, you know, just in the same way that London mm -hmm. isn't the UK, yeah. New York isn't America. You know. Well, what drove, what drove the choice? Like, why did you decide to leave the big city and, and move? And uh, obviously it wasn't a sudden decision. Um, no. Otherwise you might've gone to Jersey or Florida, like mm -hmm. all the other New Yorkers who are fleeing yes. COVID. Yeah, well, my, my wife's born and raised in New York. She's a New Yorker. And um, when I met her, sort of five years ago, four, four and a half, five years ago, she kind of said to me, look, I don't, you know, although I've been born and raised in New York, I don't want to be here forever. And I said, well, I don't want to be here forever either. Because I'd, I'd, we'd set up our business in London, but I'm actually from the north of England. So I'm used mm -hmm. to kind of wide open rolling spaces and all this sort of stuff. And so I, I don't like to, to be in places where all I can see is buildings. And of course, that's very New York. New York's an amazing city full of incredible people. And it's got, you know, I, I still say it's the best city in the world, right? But the long term, it was it was we weren't going to be in New York forever, and it was always going to be in the future, in the future. But what really happened was COVID really brought it home to us. All of a sudden, we had we went from a hundred people working in offices in London, New York, Austin, Singapore, and Sydney to everyone working from home yeah. overnight, and. It worked. It worked really well, really, really yeah. well. Our people just took to it and just ran with it. And you know, if there were any issues that you know, could, could you get people under the age of sort of twenty eight, twenty nine to really focus and and be driven and really focus on delivering? Yes, absolutely, a hundred percent. They went, they went home working, and everybody just grabbed it. And so, it was really a case of of me saying, particularly in my role now, which is kind of to promote Circus Street. 
across the US. I don't actually need to be in New York. So yeah. we took the decision to to get over here and, you know, we, we, we've been here a week. So, so far, so good. Well, you, you, you look healthy. Thanks. Um, my listeners aren't going to see the video, of course, because this is just an audio podcast. But um, I, can, I can assure everyone that Johnny Townsend is a hale and hearty looking man of a certain age like myself, I suppose, and um, looking like all the better for the move. And it's, it's making me think of getting out of the East a little bit as well. But is it really? Where would you go? I don't know yet. Um, frankly, it's not about, for me, I'm in the countryside already in near Princeton, yeah. and it's beautiful here. Um, I have deer crossing my lawn in my community every day. Um, there's too many of them, actually. But still, it's nice to see deer when you grew up in a city that, mm. you know, your, your idea of wildlife is the squirrel and the pigeon. So deer are really nice to see. Um, but without waxing political, because we promised on this podcast that wouldn't, wouldn't go that way, I will just say as a, just, it is a matter of fact that my taxes are very, very high. Mm. And now that we're, there's no reason to really commute to a particular location, what's the point? So once, once the kids are, you know, are out of school, and then it's probably a good point to just uh, go for a much more temperate location, you know? Yeah, Florida, absolutely. maybe. Do, do, yeah. do you know? Do you know what? It's it's. I was saying to our COO the other day in in, in London, Sarah. I was saying that, you know, the, the last well since I since BlackBerry turned up on the scene, really, mm-hmm. um, the kind of work life balance that everybody tries to achieve has been falling on the side of work year after year after year after year after year, after year and this is kind of a reset where. Maybe some the balance can go a bit more towards life, right? And you mentioned the commute. You know, the average commute time in London is an hour, right? And in New York, my commute was a quick commute. It was half an hour. Why, why would you spend 10 hours a week away from home? What you've got to do is you've got to introduce new disciplines. Like when do you – since I moved over to Boulder, and again, I've only been here a week, but this is the plan. Rather than be on mountain time, I'm staying on eastern time, so I'm starting earlier. My meetings yep. kind of start at 7 a.m. now. But, the, the, but I'm still working through till sort of six, seven at night. And, and what I need to do is I need to go, okay, well, you need to stop that because that, mm-hmm. that will ruin you, you know. So yep. I, think, I think some disciplines need to be brought in by the individual to make sure that they don't overwork because they can overwork and people do overwork. And uh, mm-hmm. well, it yeah, goes, work-life it goes balance. To what, yeah, it goes to what you're saying about work-life balance. And, um, you know, even as soon as remote work started to become a thing, whatever, in the last 10 years, um, you know, when broadband started to make its way across to our communities, uh, there was a lot of talk about maintaining a healthy work-life balance, you know, especially, you, and you said BlackBerry kind of turned, you made that a thing too, um, when you could get email all the time and you could be a slave to that damn thing. Mm. You know, I've been in situations, been in work, uh, you know, at, at workplaces where, you leave the office and you have that office in your pocket and it's just relentless. Um, and st- still many people I think are in that, in that zone. But now um, with actually, actually being physically in a remote location where you have the ability to make some choices during the day, yeah. um, you gotta start thinking about the life part of the work-life balance more. And um, this is an, I know that my listeners might be thinking, where are we going? This, this is a very good kind of segue into where I wanted to really uh, take the conversation here with Johnny because Johnny's company, uh, Circus Street, is an online learning and and development company. I don't know how Johnny would describe it, but I'm going to say that it is an awesome, cool uh, learning platform that is a disruptor in some ways in the industry with the the way that you guys present content, the way that you um, present a learning path, and it's primarily focused in, you know, marketing, digital marketing and and communications, but the, um, the, the style, the the content, the uh, the way that you embed yourselves with your partners um, and your you know your your mobile approach as well, all these different facets to Circus Street. It's a surprise to me that it's still kind of under the radar a little bit. Um, Circus Street, I think, is playing a bigger and bigger role, or has the opportunity to play a bigger, bigger and role, bigger role with this this first and distributed workforce. And I imagine that that's something you're thinking about these days, Johnny, but before I go too far, can you tell us a little bit more about Circus Street? You know, maybe correct what I've just said, if I've, if I've indeed uh, sold you wrong, but tell us a little bit more, more, about, more about Circus Street and what's going on and, um, and how you feel about this whole change in the industry. 
Yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for those kind words, and 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 you, you kind of summed it up real well, actually. We <laughs> we are an online learning business. Um, we've got a curriculum designed around digital transformation, um, and that's kind of a, a, a buzzword at the moment. Really, what is that? It's the latest example of how technology is modernising business, right? And so, just in the same way that um, steam modernised business, electricity modernised business. <laughs> Computers modernize business, digital technologies are modernizing businesses. So it's kind of businesses are duty bound to, to catch up. The World Economic Forum call the kind of digital transformation and everything that goes along along it and sort of connectedness and, and what have you. They call it the fourth industrial revolution because it, that's yeah. how impactful it is, right? Mm-hmm. So so we deliver a, a, a curriculum designed around that stuff. Um, and and we, we still believe we're unique in that we build a learning product and a methodology that work together that solve two major learning challenges. The first one being learner engagement. How do you get learners to actually want to use a product that is teaching them about stuff? And the second one being how to prove the kind of return on investment of learning so that, so that business leaders can appreciate its true value, right? So... So that's what we do, and, and mm-hmm. you know, the, there's a reality that business is having to face up to, which is that almost all consumers now spend most of their free time online, right? So, yeah. so companies need to get better at doing business online, but an essential part of becoming better is recognizing the need to upskill almost everyone in your business, right? So it's, it's not a few people here or there dotted around the business, it's everyone, because the business landscape's changing, it's already changed more than most people would would like to admit. And, you know, things like social media search, data analytics, e-commerce, mobile, omnichannel, all these all these technologies have created a new business environment. And it's yeah. it's one that companies need to be part of, right? Um, so that's that's the kind of stuff that we we teach. And and in terms of our our journey, if you like, we yeah. when we when we start our business, we, we kind of we broke rules right from right from the get go, right? So the first rule we broke was, you know, never set up a business with anyone in your family. Right? <laughs> and and so the first rule that we broke was that I set up a business with my brother. And mm-hmm. and we did that because we'd we'd spent decades in different fields. I was in the telecommunications sector, he was in media and advertising actually, and and I ended up uh, going through that route, managing an online learning business in the education sector. I was the MD of an online learning business in the education sector. Richard, my brother, was was a, a, a head of digital for one of the big agency groups and uh, and later set up a consultancy. And that consultancy started to get more and more into sort of teaching people how this stuff works. So it was really just a case of us eventually, after all these years, spotting that there was an opportunity to work together. Mm-hmm. And really saying, actually, what, you know, what, what we can teach is the stuff that's changing every single business and what, we can, what I can bring from my years in, in the education sector, sector is all of the reasons why e-learning doesn't work, right? Yep. Um, and so what we did is we, we, initially we, we kind of applied, we, we applied the rules that everybody already knows about content has to be engaging, has to be exciting, has to be interesting, has to be easy to digest, has to be you know, digestible anywhere, all these sorts of different things. We just applied those to corporate education because what was really bizarre was when it came to e-learning, when it came to corporate education, everybody thought you could ignore those rules. Yeah. And so they would produce fantastically large libraries of e-learning content, which was basically PowerPoint slides and a few flash interactions and well you know. well you talk about it like it's the past but that's actually the current right that's yeah. still so many are doing that and anybody yeah. who's been in a company and has had to take some kind of a training course sometimes i call you know i've often said to my colleagues that we're going we're about to be victimized by the uh, learning and development team again <laughs> and, and to their credit they're just trying to get across some some esoteric skills and some things that you, know, you don't do on a daily basis. They're getting trying to get that across to a very large number of people in a way that's where transmission and channel really matter. But it, are people learning, and is it sticking? 
I would argue that it is absolutely not learning. It is not is absolutely not sticking. It's just going through motions. So, you know, all the reasons you you mentioned that you started the company with an eye of kind of attacking all of the reasons e-learning doesn't work. Mm. I don't know if attacking is the right word, but certainly solving the solving for that problem. Yeah, you know? and and there's a reason why it's built in that way. It's because it's cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, it's because learning teams are are often under-resourced and underfunded, and businesses will say to a learning team, here's not a lot of money and not a lot of people, solve every problem for us. Yeah. And so you've got these incredibly talented people in learning teams who are just trying to do everything that the company's asking them to do on a shoestring, right? And and what's what's why we chose the topic that we chose is because what we're teaching can be applied to every single business in the world, right? But predominantly, our client base are the big CPG, FMCG brands that you would, that, that, that are in your house at the moment, right? Yeah. In your, in your, in your cupboards, in your closets, and in, in whatever, in your shower. They're the, they're, 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 that's our customer base, alongside the kind of pharmaceutical companies and, you know, anyone who's got a, a, a direct relationship with a customer. So, um, but what's, what's interesting about all of those businesses, all of those businesses are all very, very different. And all of those businesses are, are often in sometimes different sectors, but the stuff that they need to learn about up to a point is broadly the same. Google doesn't yeah. make a product for one company versus another product. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. And where you need to get to is an understanding of where you can take advantage of that, right? And, and, and so, so you're able to buy an off-the-shelf product that gets you to a long way along the journey, actually. It's quite significant how far you can, you can go with us. Many of our clients are signing up to us, enterprise deals right across their business, tens, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people for multi-year contracts with us, kind of three, five years, because mm-hmm. they recognize the, the breadth of content and what we can, and what we can deliver to them. And, um, and because it's this broad, because it's this topic that, that, that is kind of, very, very similar for, for most companies. Mm-hmm. It means that we can build a product and invest in it in the way that you should invest in learning. You know, we, we, don't, we don't go cheap. We've spent millions of dollars on a curriculum of content so that you don't have to spend millions of dollars building it yourself because it's already built, right? Yeah. We couldn't have done that with another topic. I can't think of one off the top of my head. We couldn't have done that with maybe... Well, finance, because you've got all these very different uh, regulatory systems in different countries, et cetera. Sure. I mean, it's important, I think, to delineate between, you know, learning that has to be done for compliance purposes. Yeah. You know, like I have to understand trade policy or whatever it is so that I don't, you know, so that my company is covered and mm-hmm. says that they've trained me in case I screw up when I fill out a manifest and I, you know, break all kinds of global rules and I'm done. And, you know, what, you know anyway, the, it's a compliance issue. I'm asking, I guess I'll ask you, in, in the learning and development field, there, there's the compliance-focused learning, and then there's the other, which you know, I'm just saying it's you know, actual business needs or actual skills, uh, yeah. skills learning. What, what is, a, what is the di- differentiation that you use within the industry? And, you know, um, obviously, Circus Street is on the, the latter part. It's not on the compliance side. It's on the, yeah. the other side. Yeah. 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 Well, what, you know, I, I talked about a methodology as well. Yeah. And, and again, that's so when we when we created the product, we went and we talked to lots of e-learning companies who basically said, you're mad, you can't produce what you're going to produce. And if you did, no one would buy it. Right. Mm-hmm. And we kind of ignored it. And then what we also ignored was the, the typical e-learning methodology, which is which is just send a load of logins out to people, broadly get them up to speed in a kind of sheep dip approach. And then, you know, hope to God that some behavioral change is happening. But but figure out how to measure that later. That's kind of the traditional sort of Mm -hmm. e-learning approach. What we do is we, the methodology that we use, we we, we sometimes refer to it as business impact. We, 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 I guess we always refer to it as learning as a service, which is the e-learning bit is an element of it. It's what you do before, during and after Mm-hmm. That's kind of the secret sauce, right? And you know, if you if you start, if you if you traditionally you would start up, well, what what is it your people are trying to learn? Whereas our approach is, well, what are you trying to actually achieve as a business? 
are you trying mm. to do differently? So it might be uh, we want to go from 8% direct-to-consumer sales to 30% direct-to-consumer sales by 2025. And you go, okay, let's start there then and let's have a discussion back from there as to what you need to see your people doing differently to mm -hmm. achieve that. And then, I said, and then let's go back from there to, so what do they need to be more confident in and more ready in and more prepared in? And you know, what, what, what's the mindset shift that, they, that you need to see for them to start doing things differently? And then from there, you go back to, well, this is what you need to learn then. Yeah. Because there's too much of digital in, in, in the commas to, to just put everyone through everything. You know, you've got to kind of, you've got to start with a, what's going to move the needle on the business? And if you do it that way round, yeah, and then and then support because there's a huge amount of support that then needs to happen from our account management teams and our client success teams, and around getting the implementation right and launch events and communication strategies mm -hmm. and follow up and champions calls with people in the accounts and data and proof of concept and ROI and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a real big relationship. So it's it's very different to turning on an e-learning system yeah. and flicking it out to all these learners you know that that yeah. you know time and time again has been proven not to work so it's a real mistake i think to or or maybe a misinformed assumption to compare circuit street with other e-learning platforms because that's that's just the kind of thing that people do it is. you know it, you know with their when they're when they go away from the group and they're all alone and they have their curriculum to follow and they have to go through you know whatever courses there are, and they're delivered online. So in that case, it's it's there's the E, but um, but really it's the entirety of the experience that you are putting in a package for your customers, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. And there's kind of there's kind of four stakeholders, right? Yeah. There's the, there's, there's the at the center there's the learning team, where all the pressure is, right? And then kind of around the learning team, there are there are a number of stakeholders. What one group of stakeholders is the kind of people that run the operation of the business and, and have teams that need to do things differently, right? They're, they're, they're kind of at the coal face of, right, we need to get people to do stuff in a different way. How do we get them to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then a, the, an, another stakeholder is, is, the, is the kind of the senior leadership, the budget creators. And really what, what, a, what you have to recognize there is that what they're looking at, if, if they're looking at spending an amount of money with us, our competition isn't just the other companies in our sector who are doing stuff similar to what we're doing. It's what else can they spend that money on? Yeah. Right? That's, that's your competition. Where else going to spend the money, right? So you've got to show value to those people. And then you've got the learner, right? And people talk about the learner all the time and, and getting the learner to do stuff differently and so on and Learners are time poor, particularly in corporates. They've got 25 minutes a week to do everything other than work, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm a learner, I've got to understand why it is I'm doing it. What's in it for me? Yeah. Right? And, and, and because a lot of, of what you do with learners or a lot of what traditional learning does with learners is it says, here's your goal. You have to achieve it by then. You know, here's a, here's a stick to hit you over the head with. Or if we're feeling nice... Here's a carrot-shaped stick mm -hmm. that we're going to hit you over the head with, you know, in forms of a competition or whatever. But it's kind mm -hmm. of the same thing. That's not that's not creating a desire in the learner to learn. Well, that's the way it most commonly is delivered to people, right? I mean, you have to learn these items and pass a test by a certain time, you know, or usually the consequence is something like, or you'll have to take the course again, you know. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I mean... I have never, I mean, fortunately, I've never been in a position where the, uh, where the e-learning or the testing part of it is like, is high stakes or, or, or mission critical to the point that, you know, you really need to pass this or else you will lose your job or you have mm. to, you know, that, I'm, and I'm sure there are definitely jobs where that's the case, licensing, for example. Or, mm. But what we're talking about here is more the value of the kind of learning for digital transformation is in your ability to suddenly understand, not suddenly, but your ability to comprehend and understand the changes that are happening around you and what you can contribute, mm -hmm. you know, to those changes, skill-wise, mm -hmm. strategy-wise, you know, it runs the gamut, but mm -hmm. also to, to understand when, when people come and talk to you about this stuff, you'll be able to understand what they're saying to you. I've always found that to be one of the most critical 
skills for a marketer anyways. You know, it's not that you always have to know exactly how to do, and let's just say SEO, because I often pick on SEO on this program, but you know, uh, let's just say SEO. You don't have to know how to do it, but you should know enough about it so that when somebody comes and talks to you and tries to sell you a bag of beans, you can say, you know, that's just a bag of beans. You're not selling me mm. SEO. You know, mm. I know what SEO is and that's not it. Mm. So, but I mean, so anyway, there's a lot of, my point is there's a lot of elements to what you need to take away from learning. And that's not even scratching the surface of the return on learning that you mentioned earlier from the business side, right? I mean, mm. the business side needs to see that whatever they're investing in this platform is actually going to return to them. And maybe that, that kind of brings up, we've been talking about the learning platform and we've been turn, talking about e-learning as a sort of thing, but what are the elements of a good e-learning experience from the Circus Street standpoint? Like what are the elements of a good lesson, um, of a good piece of content? You mentioned earlier that one of the sort of disruptive things that you did was to take a what makes good content approach and apply that to the lessons that you were creating. Mm. You know, um, obviously it's just one element. So what, what are the elements of a good lesson and what, what makes a good learning experience? Well, I think first of all, you've got to, as a learner, you've got to, you've got to know the so what. You've got to be able to answer the so what, right? I'm, I'm being asked to learn this, mm -hmm. so what? You know, again, the what's in it for me? You know, what, what am I going to expect? What's it? What's 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 the business going to expect me to do differently? I guess as a result. Mm -hmm. And again, that is often not communicated to to learners. And we've done that in the past where we've launched learning programs and sort of said, get, do 18 lessons, you'll get a certificate and all that. And that's kind of, that was kind of our first foray into this stuff. And what you found is that learners eventually, when they got to 18 lessons, they, and, and you know, our curriculum is about 120 lessons, I think it is. They got to kind of 18 lessons and, and, and it clicked, the penny dropped. And they said, oh, yeah, right, now I get it. I'm, I'm starting to have different conversations. I'm starting to have, you know, different thoughts and different ideas and what have you, and that's starting to permeate out into the work that I do, et cetera. But that was, we, we, we sort of said, okay, but how do we solve that if somebody isn't getting to that point straight away? And that's, and that's by, you know, t talking to the learner about why they should be learning this stuff in the first place. So that's, that's an essential ingredient, right, mm -hmm. to, to get go. And they gotta know got their to, why, right? They yeah, know the why, why. exactly. Yeah. And then you've got to deliver learning that's, that's relevant and that's relevant to them, right? So it's not, You know, our, our product is a product that's really designed for, you know, businesses over sort of 500 employees, right? So mm -hmm. it's not, a, you know, it's not, if you're a florist, there are, there are better products than Circus Street to teach you how to do digital. Our mm -hmm. stuff's about, you know, you've got all these moving parts. It's yeah. not just marketing, it's sales, it's finance, it's HR. It's all these, it's, it's how is it affecting every uh, area of the business. And then what you've got to do is you've got to, you've got to deliver a great experience so that people open up the product and go, this is great. I mean, I, I like to watch this. I like to spend time looking at this. I like to use this product. I can use it on my commute. I can use it on a mobile. I can use it in this LMS. I can use it independently of an LMS. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've used the product yourself. Yeah. And, you, know, you, know, you know what it's like. People sort of talk to us. The, 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 a quote we've often heard is, you're kind of like the Netflix of learning and that you, you're giving <laughs> us stuff that's really super relevant, but it's also, yep. it's, when you do a lesson, people will say to us, and then I wanted to do another one, right? Or, or, you know, in the past, I've had conversations with people where they've said, you know, I sat with my husband and we watched this, having a glass of wine, right? Because it was, it, was, <laughs> it was decent entertainment, you know, yeah. as much as anything, you know, professional TV presenters, all that sort of stuff. You know, and then and then you have to have the follow up from there of, okay, it's now gone in. You've now learned. What are you doing with it? How's it affecting things? And then you and then you collect that kind of follow up and you feed it back to the business to show that stuff's happening that's different. Yeah, and and um, you did just bring up that I, I have used the platform. I should have made that clear from the beginning, or I was waiting for my opportunity to talk about that a little bit. But um, yeah, I I am uh, a Circus Street user. Do we want to use the word user anymore? But it, I guess I guess we do. But learner. I'm a Circus Street learner. Yes. What do they say? They say that that computer companies and drug pushers and, and drug pushers are the only, are the only customers who have you know, who are yeah. users. Yeah. So learners. Is a learners. Word, right? I I you know I I'm a I'm a I'm a learner from of the or an experienced learner from the Circus Street platform, and um, the courses are entertaining, digestible 
practical. The production quality, of course, is something that you know you've talked about, but it is definitely you know head and shoulders above what you would see on many other. Um, it's a, let's put it this way: it is a far, 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 far cry from a PowerPoint presentation, you know, and slides going across the screen and memorize this. It's engaging narrators, you know, engaging um, animations, and you know the way it's structured just seems to feel like it's just the right amount of time and you check on your retention and you have that that before and after element where you check your knowledge before and then you check after to see how much you know how far you've gone. I know some people who have who have started off and said, "Oh yeah, it looks like I'm 75% or 70% uh knowledgeable of this topic." And then they take the course and it gets them up to 80 or 85 and they're like, "What? I didn't realize it was that hard." And they want to do it again and get themselves up to 100 for Christ's sake, I'm getting to 100. <laughs> and, you know, they want to keep going because it's exciting and, and, it's, and it's certainly um, challenging. And, you know, there's that spirit of, of competition that, that you get into a little bit too sometimes. Yeah, thank um, you, Dan. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, but it's a, it's a great platform and, and I haven't experienced anything like it. I'm starting to see other learning products out there that are, you know, um, I'm not going to say that you guys are all shoot, playing from this, you know, singing from the same, hymnal um but aiming for entertainment as a way to mm. get the message across mm. i saw one recently that was like a series of of episodes like based loosely on friends uh right. about about uh, network security right, you know right right um so it's not the same thing as digital transformation and it's it was more about you know remember to leave your you know to lock your laptop that kind of thing yeah. um well, there, there was actually there was a company years ago called called Video Arts. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember that company? Not really. So Video yeah. Arts was when you bought corporate training on 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 a video cassette, mm -hmm. and you would all sit around in a room, you know, and you would you would plug in this video and you would watch it on a kind of group TV. Video Arts was started by John Cleese of Monty Python, oh. and he he worked out that actually if he got people like Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry and mm -hmm you know, Jennifer Saunders and, and Ricky Gervais in a room all to act out different roles. Yeah. It would really work. And it, and it, it, was, a, it was a great product. You can't do SEO with it. You can't do data analytics with it. You can do customer service, opening the sale, how to do mm -hmm. a, a great HR interview. You can't do programmatic. You can't yeah. do, you know, all the stuff that's kind of business critical right now. That yeah. has to be done in a, in a different way. Um, so it's been done. It's been that sort of engaging content's been done really well before, and it's still done really well by by other people as well. But the the content is half of it. Yeah. The methodology is the other half. The learning mm -hmm. as a service is the other half. That's yep. what really drives engagement. What we found is if we, we did a kind of couple of tests, I think the average engagement for e learning is about sort of twenty five percent, something like mm -hmm. that, across a, a customer base. When you get into the MOOCs, it's even less. Um, we kind of, being multiple uh, online. No, uh, massive no. open online courses. Massive, op yeah. massive open online courses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of mother of all bombs, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, acronym. But um, we found that we, we were significantly, we had significantly higher engagement rates than traditional online learning if we just sent people the online learning. But when we led on the methodology, mm -hmm. that's where you get 95% engagement rates. Yeah, across tens of thousands of people, because yeah. they because they understand why that it's it, they're doing it in the same way that they come to work. That's the service part of the learning as a service yeah. when you say yeah. when you say the methodology, right? Yeah. So yeah. And, and I should have maybe mentioned that because like, in our case, when you when you guys worked with us, we we had kickoff meetings. We had the learners involved in figuring out what the best learning paths were. Yeah. You know, we designed. We had a a, a sort of committee that was working on. You know, several custom learning paths. Mm. You know, for different sets of courses, different sets of lessons that would be good for different functions within each department. Mm. You know, when we kicked off, the, our, our team from Cirque Street was just excellent in relating all this to us and kind of explaining, getting us excited about it, but at mm. the same time, presenting data uh, in in a in a way that made it clear how we were progressing um, and you know what the outcomes were. Mm. Um, and then as the program went on, the team liaised with me and with others for sure um, on to try to keep the learners active. Mm. And I love that about it because the circuitry team would monitor engagement. Yeah. 
mm. with the pro, with the platform, and and we we got uh, leaderboards about which people and which teams were doing better, and then you know it goes on that way in a con- very consultative way until mm. the program uh, you know is either at a milestone point or at an end point where um where we get another set of data to see how we did, and yeah, so it was um it was a full service experience. And I think that that was a lot different then. Here's your compliance driven, you know, accounting practices, avoiding fraud 101, Mm. click on this link, go through this and complete the lesson. Mm. It's very different. Yeah. And and there's a number of reasons why we were able to do that. And one of them was we took the decision really early on to bring everything in house. So Mm -hmm. platform, tech, content, production, account management, service, sales, marketing, everything. Is, is, is under one roof or under multiple roofs actually spread across the, the globe because mm-hmm. we also wanted to be in market with clients yeah. as well, which was, which was really, really important. And then the other bit, <clears throat> which is really important, is that, and it, <laughs> and it kind of worked against us as well because you said Circus Street's kind of under the radar, right? And you're absolutely right. We are kind of under the radar. One of the reasons why we're kind of under the radar, but also the benefit of we were able to do things in exactly the way that we wanted it to do, mm-hmm. is we never took any investment. Yeah. So we built we built to this where competitors around us were kind of taking you know a hundred raising a hundred million dollars, and then going out into market. And I remember talking to the chief exec of one of our major competitors, and he said, "I wanted to build the business that you've built. Unfortunately, I raised a hundred million dollars, and I had to build this business." Right, <laughs> so it's, so we were able to, to to do that, and and so we've kind of bootstrapped it, yeah, um, all the way along. Um, but we're now at a point where, you know, we're successful enough that we can start to pour money into getting more people to know us. You know, clearly you've you've got some amazing, huge customers, uh, repeating repeating clients, yeah, and um, you know the work that you're doing, and especially you know across the. You know, digital transformation, as you said, to me, it was a digital marketing program um, was, you know, I've, I haven't seen anything that rivals it um, across learning platforms that I've played with. But it's good to see that, you know, you're building it the right way, mm. or at least a way that doesn't compromise mm. your approach and your values and, and your methods. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting also because... Um, it's like a mix of being an individually driven thing and an organizationally mandated mm. thing. And um, I keep harking back to this, to that compliance thing, which is totally 100% organizationally mandated. But like, it seems like uh, Circus Street is a, is a hybrid. I mean, but clearly learning is different when it's self-driven versus mm. when it is mandated. And how does Circus Street address that? What are the challenges for each? Um, or what do you think, how do you think it, it, it plays into what, what Circus Street offers? Well, it, it, you know, people will spend time um, being curious about things that they're interested in, right? Mm-hmm. If you think about to what I said about learners have around 25 minutes a week to learn, right? And they're, they're time poor anyway, and they're overstretched anyway. And then we kind of expect them to go in, well, do, you know, go and figure out SEO, you know, <laughs> if it, if it, if it you know, if it tickles your fancy, go and have a look at search, you know, or whatever, you know. It's, and, it, and it's kind of, you know, from our experience, <clears throat> when people come to work, what they're really saying a lot of the time is, look, tell me what you want me to do. Yeah. And I'll go and do it, right? And if there's 20 things that you want me to do, and I can only do 10, I'll do the 10 that I think are the most important. And the things that are the most important are the 10, that, the 10 things that will give me the most benefit and, and give the company the most benefit, Right. Yeah. So you kind of start from there. You know, in, in the past, we've had companies say to us, what we really, really want is a platform where a learner can go into this platform and it can just, the learner can type something in that they might be interested in. Like, I don't know, how does, how does social media work, right? Mm. And then they'll be presented with a, a, a number of assets. One might be a, a talk by some experts. Another might be a white paper. Another might be, a video interview, another might be an article that they could read. You know, that's the utopia. Yeah. You know? And then and then when you kind of remind them that they've had that for 20 years, it's called Google, <laughs> and people still that's don't right. know this stuff, then there's kind of, the, there's your answer to a certain extent. If it's, if it's been readily available for 20 years and they still don't know this stuff, you know, maybe they need a, maybe they need a little bit of a push. Yeah. Right? Or not so much a little bit of a push. 
maybe they need curated content, mm -hmm. which is here's the stuff you, rather than you spend hours and hours and hours and hours hacking through the weeds, here's yeah. the stuff you need to know. And here it is presented in a way that you'll understand it and appreciate it. Is that, is that connected to the concept of curious learner that you were telling me about before? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen, the, there's, there's lots of stuff around, the, the, around curiosity in, in learners, right? And how do, you, how do you create a curious learner and what have you? And people have written, written lots of books on it. And I, and I don't profess to be an expert in it. And I think mm -hmm. it's more, it's not just about expecting more from your learners. It's about creating the environment for them to be given permission to be curious and the tools to be curious and all that sort of stuff. But, but quite often it's, that's just not the environment, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things about environment is that often learners need to be given or feel as though they need to be given permission to learn because it, it, it's not work, you know? Or, or they don't see it as work. Or they don't yeah. see it as work, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's, it's, it's important if you, you know, it, just in the same way that when we, when we sort of say to a business, learning is working, yep. what, what businesses want, want us to do straight away is go, how is, how is behavior changing in our business as a result of this learning? Well, behavior changing in your business doesn't just rely on learning, right? If you're going to do some of this stuff better, not only do you have to have a, a, a better educated workforce, you need new structures, you need new management, you need new permissions, you need new bonuses, you need new KPIs, you need new partners, you need new tech in your business. You know, you need a different proposition to take your customers. You need to have everything aligned. You know, there's, there's, there's so many different variables that, that need to happen to lead to behavioral change. You know, but there are yeah. measures you can do along the way. You've already, you've already talked about how we test learners on a subject before they learn anything to see where the benchmark is. And then we test them on the other side of that. And then we test them again, you know, to see is the knowledge being retained and, you know, and then we do outreach calls and we, we sort of talk about how people are, are using the, the stuff and whatever. And then we do surveys around mindset and confidence and readiness and preparedness. Do you feel more prepared to be able to go and do this stuff as a result of the learning that you've learned? Yes. Okay. Well then that's kind of behavior. That's that's the first step towards behavioral change. Mm -hmm. Once everything else is 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 lined up, and then what you've got to do is join the dot between the behavioral change you're wanting to see and the ultimate business result, right? And that's how yeah. and that's how you, in our experience anyway, that's how you create value for senior leadership to say that's worth investing in. Because I, I read a stat recently that said. 70, I think it was, it was 70 something percent of senior leaders don't believe that training delivers any value whatsoever, <laughs> right? That's a hurdle. Is that across the boards? Yeah, that's a hurdle for any learning team to have to get across. So be, spending time with those folk, which is what we do, to, 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 to really kind of discuss with them that actually, if they're wanting to do these things, they're going to be in a much better shape to do these things if they can drive behavioral change. And they're in a much better shape to drive behavioral change if they've got a more confident and prepared and ready workforce. And they'll have a much better confident and prepared and ready workforce if they educate them in these topics. Because yeah. without that education, you won't deliver these things. It is inextricably tied, it seems, to uh, corporate culture then. Because cultures need to change uh, in order to identify the behaviors that we need to, you know, effect, and whether a learning solution is what will help with those behaviors or not, some of the behaviors for sure. But it seems like that if if you have seventy five percent or seventy some percent of senior leaders saying that learning doesn't provide any value whatsoever, they're not thinking about culture. It seems to me, mm. um, like I, I would imagine that a learning organization is an attractive organization. A learning organization is one that um, can really understand the changes that companies have to go through, like the digital transformation, for example. You know, and you can't do that without having a culture that embraces change or that embraces the core values that underpin the learning itself. It's a little circular, I think, when you think about it. But nowadays, I, I think that it's accelerated, um, as so many things have, as your move to Colorado did by this distributed workforce that we, that we now 
have, that so many people have. Like this work from home phenomenon. You know, hell, I've been working from home for years on occasion, but now that it's, it's like almost mandated by so many companies, you know, I love it. I love working from home. A lot of people don't. Mm. Um, but if you could work from home and you could learn and you could like belong to something bigger than just this little office that you're in all day and just like, you know, I think that it drives a sense of belonging, drives a sense of like shared values with a company if learning is a key part of that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we saw a massive spike in engagement in the oddest times when everyone went into lockdown. Yeah. Bizarrely, you wouldn't think it. We saw a massive spike in weekend engagement with the product, which was kind of odd because they were, they were home anyway yeah. before. It's just that they couldn't, I guess people couldn't go out, couldn't socialize, whatever. We're kind of using that downtime to learn. You know, once you've watched Tiger King on Netflix and it's all yep. finished, you have to kind of find something else to do. And yeah, I've, you know, I, I wonder, that's, an, that's a really interesting finding because anecdotally, um, I have heard and seen that, you know, a lot of people are considering career changes and considering, mm-hmm. you know, really taking stock of their lives now with COVID happening and whatnot. So I wonder if that, you know, increase in engagement on the platform on the weekends is people saying, okay, look, I'm going to bust my ass for the company during the week, but you know what? I got nothing else to do on the weekends anymore. I'm stuck at home and I still feel a little bit funny about using my work time for learning time. Mm. So I might as well like bear down on the weekends and by the way, pick up a few skills while I'm at it mm. um, to improve my chances once all this stuff is over. I wouldn't be surprised if that is part of the reason why all this stuff happens. I don't know. You know. Yeah, and no, I think you might be onto something. And I think certainly from our point of view, it, it has brought particularly enterprise conversations. So where, we, where a business says to us, we want to get this around every single person in the business. I can think of a, of a yeah. pharmaceutical company that we work with that, that where their chief exec said, I want us to do a million hours of learning this year. Um, you know, and that was across 100,000 people that we work wow. with. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, there, there, there is, a, there is a, an element of people upskilling for, you know, a different life, but also mm-hmm. there, is, um, there is the fact that this has brought on, if you think about what COVID has done, for mm-hmm. the digital economy, yeah, it's brought oh, it's forward people's and companies' kind of digital transformation plans by about three to five years. I heard ten in oh, some really? cases. Wow. Yeah, like it's really accelerated, yeah. like crazy. Yeah. So companies that were saying to us, "Listen, we we might do this next year. We've got some other stuff." They kind of got on the phone straight away and said, "Right, let's launch now." And we were like, "Well, you can't launch now because." <laughs> As I've already said, you don't just turn it on, but we, you know, we can we can start the process, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's it's accelerated the need for this stuff, and uh, and also just in the same way that companies have proven that home learning can work. Uh, sorry, home working can work. Mm-hmm. Home learning can work too. Yeah, I've found, and maybe this isn't the best thing to say to you, uh, who is you know who is the founder and president of a of a digital learning platform, mm. but I have found it very pleasant to return to the comfort of, a, of paper books, paper. Yeah. Like for the first time in ages, I've actually started to order paperbacks. I've, well, not paper, I mean, well, technically paperbacks, but not novels, like do my learning from, from paperbacks because I'm just sitting here looking at screens all the time and I'm like, yeah. you know what? But that, that's a different kind of learning. That's not the same type of thing. This is my own individual kind of edification. Yeah. Doing I, like, I, you know, and I'm the same. Like, I'm the same. I prefer, you know, I, I did what everybody did. Got mm-hmm. a Kindle. Yeah. Used it got for a year to went back to books. I don't know well, what happened, I, but but it did. Well, now I use my Kindle for fiction, yeah. almost exclusively. Yeah. And I have I decided that I can't do, I can't do business books, nonfiction, those kinds of things on my Kindle um, as the main source of that book. Like if I if I buy a book on Kindle because I happen to be at a conference or something and I'm really enjoying the speaker. So I'll just, oh, I want to start reading this book and I'll grab it on Kindle. Um, I will very likely, if I like the first five pages, just order the, the, um, right. the version, the, the soft cover version, you know, the real paper version. But um, well, I will read notes and stuff yeah. like that. It's like that, that was the thing that we cottoned on to real early on as well, is that 
you know, we'd, we'd produce this all singing, all dancing, video-based learning, game-based, mm-hmm. you know, 30 second, 30 minute features, 10 minute spotlight lessons, et cetera, et cetera. What we also found quite quickly is that actually, if we, if in the downloads of a lesson, mm-hmm. we put a script in that people could print out, yeah. we did that too. And, and, yeah. and learners would say to us, what was great about the script is I could make notes as I was as I was watching the stuff, I could make notes on the script, take those with me, you know, etc. Yeah, and that comes in particularly handy when you're dealing yeah. with people of different cultures and languages as well. Yeah, yeah. Who's who? Where English might not be their 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 native language, yeah. as as we know with with our experience. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that was another question that I had. Actually, is like is like the technology that you have going behind. Um, Circus Street, and one of the reasons why it is so much not only so engaging and so much fun to use, it's it's actually effective, is because of the some of the bells and whistles, and you know they're not, you know they're more I guess additional learning features uh, that are included in, like in, in in the app and in the platform with all the resources that you that you append to each lesson mm. and so on. But um, with that in mind, I know you're always developing, and I know that there's always things happening. So let let me put it to let me get, make this a two part question: What is the future for Circus Street? Mm. And what do you think is the future for e-learning, mm. or or just learning? Period. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's kind of there, there are near-term futures for Circus Street. So different different types of content, varying lengths of content. You know, we launched Spotlights a while ago. They're ten ten minute lessons. They went off like a a rocket. Everybody loved those. We're looking at even shorter lessons, kind of two or three minute lessons, specifically designed for mobile. Gamification mm-hmm. on mobile um, is really going to be really important to us, um, and also uh, I suppose a really big one. You, you touched on it there is translation. So mm-hmm. translating the content into multiple languages so that a business can go enterprise and have learners who can see an English speaking product, but also have learners in Japan, which is obviously very close to your heart, and Latin yeah. America, and you know all sorts of other places as well. So that's obviously. Um, another area of development. And then what's also interesting is that we've got a a huge amount of data now that we can say to organizations, this is is how you compare to other businesses in your sector, without naming those businesses, of course. Yeah. We can say, look, this is how it looks like, this is how you look like against other CPGs around knowledge, around confidence, around preparedness, around, you know, whatever. And this is what you look like in region. And this is what you look like in role. And yeah. using that data is going to be really important for us as well going forward. And, um, and, then, and then sort of seamless integration with all the different LXPs, LMSs, TMSs, mm-hmm. you know, all these TLAs, these three-letter acronyms yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that, that make up this kind of platform world. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the future of learning, it, one, thing about, one thing about education anyway whether it's corporate, school, university, or whatever. If you, if you took a doctor from 150 years ago and put mm-hmm. them in a modern-day hospital, they would effectively be redundant. Yeah, right? of course. But if, if you, I used to have a, a photograph on my desk of a classroom from the 1830s, <laughs> and it was one teacher in front of a chalkboard with 30 students in the room, Right? And that, and so the, has that really developed that much? And and Not too much. corporate training being the, a similar sort of thing, four people in a room, all really catching up on emails, right? All yep. looking at their phones, all paying a little bit of attention, but not much. All being told they've got to be there, so they're not necessarily in the right frame of mind. I think flexibility is the future. Fle- flexibility and relevance and access is the future of learning. The way allow me to learn about stuff in the way that I want to do it, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. That, that, that to me is the, the, the future that we should all be working towards. But, but, but that doesn't mean that you, you're saying, so it's the curious learner, right? It's an interesting world to think about. I keep thinking about like what happens if, when, when you start to add VR and AR and all these crazy things to it. I mean, different types of learning will take different, mm-hmm. or different types of skills will be, will, will, will be increasingly available for online learning, I think, or for, for digital learning. Um, but for the time being, I think for um, the future that you're painting, 
for your particular space for corporate learning sounds like spot on. I mean, people, I think, especially as distributed workforces become more and more the thing, you need that flexibility and you're mm. going to need that access and, you know, more and more and more of that, not less and less. And of course, variety, you know. Yeah. And, I, and, and we tried a lesson in VR and um, mm. people could use it for about three or four minutes before they start to feel a bit car sick. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think the, te- the tech has to get to a certain yeah. point. Yeah, you know. and I saw a beautiful thing with VR though. It's the it's 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 the thing that really made me think. That's just a fantastic use of technology, mm-hmm. and it was for people at end of life care. Oh, beautiful! And so they, yeah. would, they would have someone in a nursing home who maybe got you know a visit a week from their family, who mm-hmm. you know had been an architect, and a VR headset allowed them to stand in kind of Dumbo Park. And paint the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, so nice. You know, that's and, great. And that was just to, or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. or go running on a beach if they were an athlete, you know, and just to be able to look around them and, and, you know, feel the kind of wind in their hair, so to speak, you know, that wow. to me was fantastic use of technology. And it, and it really sort of tugged at my heartstrings when I read it. It's, it's always nice to see when technology is used for, truly improving people and truly improving humanity. And I, I, look, I think learning is, is one is in that zone. It's really something that we need, that, we, that, that makes us better. You know, knowledge is definitely a better thing to have uh, than not have, I think, you know, in general. And if, you're, if circuitry can make it happen in, in an entertaining and in, in a effective way, you know, then you're doing the right thing. Yeah. For, for, forewarned is forearmed, right? Yeah, clearly. Yeah, you know, if only everybody prepared. would really. You've been prepared for the world as it is. Yeah. You know, and, you, and you've got to get ready. If you're a business, you have to get ready for the world as it is. Yeah, 100% agree. So this has been an excellent conversation, Johnny. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, if anybody wants to learn more about Circus Street, go to circusstreet.com. It's one word, C-I-R-C-U-S-S-T-R-E-E-T.com. If you want to learn about Johnny Townsend, you can find him on LinkedIn, um, and his name is spelled as it will be in the title of this episode. Apart from that, Johnny, is there any place else that people should? Is there anything else you're working on, or anything that people should know? No, I mean, I think I think you know. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to come on here. It's always a, a, it. a pleasure talking to you, Dan, and, uh, and so I really appreciate you letting me sort of wax lyrical for <laughs> or semi lyrical for an hour. Um, no, I mean, I think it's it's, it's just. It's great to see businesses now kind of leaping into this stuff and recognizing that, you know, an investment in people is never a bad investment. And so, you know, obviously we're, uh, we're happy to be part of that and, um, and long may it continue, you know. Here, here. Thanks, Johnny. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. If you enjoyed this episode of The Dan Nessel Show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.